Well, hey everybody, let me welcome you to our online service today. And can I just say thanks for joining us? You know, for the last seven months, our church, like almost all the churches in America, have moved from public gatherings to online worship services like this out of consideration, you know, for the weakest and the most vulnerable among us, you know, people who are, you know, vulnerable to COVID uh, infection and those who have pre-existing conditions that COVID could really exacerbate. And I mean, we've just tried our best as a church to put the needs of others before ourselves. And I can't even tell you how thankful I am for the character that our church has demonstrated, you know, as you've continued to serve and give and just, you know, love people in the name of Jesus through really disruptive days. I'm telling you, it is humbling to be a part of a church with the character that our church has, and I just love you for it. Now, friends, we believe that we can now safely resume our public services if we're diligent in some specific precautions. And you know how it is, man. The, the larger the church is, the harder it is to start back. But if we can be diligent, at least at first, uh, we can plan to regather our church on September 23 and 27 at every one of our campuses. Now, friends, as you know, we have already started regathering. Man, we had our Compassion College Ministries this past week. They met at our Ocean Worship Center, which let me tell you, is pretty awesome. And man, they had a great worship service out there. It was just fantastic. They were safe and they were smart. And let me tell you, it was better because they were together. Uh, man, we had a family come to the church here at the Henderson campus after we finished the nine o'clock service this past weekend. Uh, they had a young man named Wynn Fagel. Wynn is 10 years old. Man, he is one of the folks who gave his life to Jesus during these online ser only services. And his mama told him, he said, look, he said, I need to be baptized. And she's like, well, you know, we're starting back on September 23rd. And he's like, I don't want to wait till September 23rd. And I'm thinking, dude, way to go. That's my boy. I wouldn't wait either. And so, man, they came up here after church. Man, we met with their family. Uh, man, we had the opportunity to baptize one into Christ. Harrison met him up here. And man, I'm just super excited about this regathering because friends, as amazing as our ministry has been through this time of isolation, and I'm telling you, we have honored Christ in amazing ways. I'm telling you, the body of Christ is designed to be together. Now, we believe that the original blueprint for the New Testament church is found in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. And I want to invite you to turn in your Bible there right now so that we can see what the Bible has to say about how the church operates, man, when it's working right. Now, I'm talking with you today from our Henderson Worship Center, okay? This is our broadcast site. Uh, this building, well, let me tell you, this building was carefully and prayerfully built from a blueprint that we followed super carefully. Consequently, man, this building is beautifully and functionally safe and strong, just like all of the other campuses that we built. Now, Acts 2.42 is the blueprint for the New Testament church. And when you build it according to this blueprint, the body of Christ is beautiful and functional and safe and strong. And we're going to look at that passage over the next couple of weeks and figure out why. Now, before we do that, let me just give you a little bit of the backstory. Fifty days before this passage was written, Jesus had risen from the dead. It was a historical miracle. Awesome. And then for the next 40 days, he was preparing his disciples to establish the church in Jerusalem as a launch pad to take the gospel literally around the world. And then Jesus returned to God. And 10 days later, as promised, the Holy Spirit came. And then the apostle Peter preached the first gospel message that talked about the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus and the salvation that was possible now. And friends, Thousands of people were moved to put their faith in Jesus and be baptized on the day of Pentecost. And dude, that was the launch of the church. And you can read all about it right here in Acts chapter 2, starting verse 1 and just reading you catch up. And then I want you to look at what these members of the New Testament church did in verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer and because they did, everybody was filled with a sense of awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were being done by the apostles. Man, all the believers were together. I wish you were here to say together with me, you know? They had everything in common. They were selling their possessions and their goods and then they gave to everyone who had a need. Listen, what is this? They're serving. Back in the New Testament church, immediately they're serving. And then every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts. What is that? 
They're, they're worshiping together. Big groups of people gathering to worship. And man, they broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. What is that? Dude, that's home groups, discipleship groups. They're meeting all over the city. It's awesome. And because they did these things, the Lord was adding to their number daily people who were being saved. Now, friends, we're going to study this blueprint over the next few weeks in preparation for the regathering of our church. But I want you to look at verse 42 one more time. It says they devoted themselves to some disciplines that caused the church to grow strong and fast and healthy. It says they devoted themselves. Look at this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Devoted themselves to these priorities. Now, did you notice there is a definite article in front of apostles' teaching and fellowship and breaking of bread? Now, friends, that's not an accident. That is a very intentional thing. Listen, the apostles' teaching, not not just reading the Bible on your own, but the gathering of the church for specific teaching from the apostles, you know, the 12 guys that travel with Jesus. The teaching was more powerful when they got together to hear the apostles teaching. It talks about the fellowship, man, not just hanging out with your friends, but the body intentionally getting together, interacting with people you know and love, interacting with people you never met before because they feel love because you're interacting with them. Friends, something powerful happens when we get together like that. He talks about the breaking of bread, which is a, a reference you know, to the body of Christ getting together for communion. Listen, something powerful happens when we gather together and take the communion. It is a powerful thing. I've had so many people tell me, you know, since we've been online only, you know, some weeks we don't even take communion. I mean, we forget to get ready. I mean, we've done videos about it. We've told you how to get a communion starter kit. And yet still, you know, sometimes it slips up on folks and they don't even take the Lord's Supper weeks at a time. But I've also heard from people say how special it is, you know, when the family gets together and takes communion together and makes an effort to make it special. Well, friends, apparently the impact is multiplied when the body takes the Lord's Supper all together. And then even prayer, which didn't carry the you know, definite ad- article in the text, can be so much more powerful when the church is together. Now, you know, it says just a couple chapters farther on in Acts chapter four, that after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God boldly. Now, I know the building doesn't shake every time we pray together and it didn't shake every time they pray together in the New Testament either. But if you ask any seasoned believer, they can tell you of a time when the church knelt together or joined together in prayer that was way more powerful than just praying for somebody alone. I was right here in this worship center a couple years ago at our Pivot Men's Rally. And one of the pastors in town over Gateway Church had a brain tumor and his life was in danger. And I remember 1,600 men standing up in this room and all extending a hand over toward Pooler, where this guy's house was, and praying for God to heal that man. And let me tell you, God has done an amazing work in restoring that brother since that time. But you ask any of the men in that room, what was their favorite part of that service that night? And I'll bet you they will tell you when we stood and we prayed for our brother who was in danger. Now, friends, you got to know that there are just foundational functions of the church that work better when we are doing them together than when we're not. And you also got to know that my hope is to get you just pumped up about our plans for regathering our church on September 23 and 27. Man, listen. This is the last time I'm preaching on a Wednesday to an empty room. Thank God. Next week, we're going to have people in here. It's going to be awesome. But our whole church is going to regather on September 23 and 27. If you're a volunteer, you'll be here next Wednesday. You'll be here next Sunday because we've got regathering training services for all of our volunteers on the 9th and 13th and 16th and 20th. And man, I just, I'm telling you, I can't wait for us to get back together. But I want us to start thinking about the power of hearing God's word together today. Now, friends, the apostles' teaching is listed first in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, because it is the highest priority when we worship together. Dude, if you don't engage with the Bible, you won't hear the gospel and you'll never get saved and you won't worship and you won't grow spiritually. And and listen, if you don't engage the word a lot, you're never going to get spiritually strong. 
Consequently, when we built this Henderson Worship Center, we did something symbolic that I have never heard of any church doing before. And just as a way of kind of reminding ourselves that our church and our lives are built on God's word and built on God's wisdom, we literally wrote the entire New Testament by hand on the walls and the floor and the stage of this building while it was in, under construction in one weekend. We wrote the entire New Testament all through this building one weekend. I'm telling you, we wrote it on the walls. We wrote it on the floors. We had it on the stage. We had it in multiple languages. And let me tell you, we have inscribed God's word on the walls and floors of every other worship center we've ever built. You know why? Because we want to remember how important it is to hear God's word and stand on God's word and build your life on God's word every time you walk into one of our worship centers. Now, friends, that happens in a special way when we're together that I just don't think happens when we're not. And listen, I thank God for our online services and I'm thankful for all of you new folks who are part of our ministry today because of our online services. But friends, I'm concerned. I'm concerned for anybody who is only part of our online services. Now, if that's all that's possible for you, you live in Antarctica, there are no churches down there, you can't get to one. I get it. Man, we love you. We're going to have this online service just for you. We're going to make it as powerful as possible. And we're even going to give you an opportunity to serve online if you're going to be a part of our online ministry. But friends, I'm telling you, you will never have the growth experience online that's available when the body of Christ gathers together. Now, here's what I'm expecting in the days ahead. I'm expecting people who have been led to Jesus because of our online services to come to Savannah. I mean, fly into this city. I want to meet our pastor. I want to meet our church. I want to be baptized here. I want to connect with this church in a special way. Now, you don't have to do that, but I'm expecting that kind of thing will happen. But I'll tell you what I do hope. I hope you will not get stuck only online because there is more and it is for you. So friends, let's start out today with the highest priority function of New Testament worship. And that is the teaching of the word of God. Now, friends, look at me. Listen to me. Teaching God's word includes both when a gifted worship leader helps you sing God's word, as well as when a gifted teacher is explaining and applying God's word to your life. Both are built on the apostles' teaching. Friends, we don't sing these vapid, feel-good songs that are devoid of the apostles' teaching. And let me tell you, they're out there. We just don't do those songs. Sometimes we'll get a song and we like almost all of it, but there's something that we feel like is inconsistent with the word. And so we'll change, don't tell anybody, but we'll change it up a little bit to get things aligned a little bit more closely to the teaching of the apostles. Because our singing and our messages are designed to impact your heart and mind with the teaching of the apostles who spent those three years traveling with Jesus. Why? Because God speaks to us through his word. And so today, let's explore two ways that God speaks to his people. Today, primarily, he speaks to us through the Bible. Now, you know, a number of years ago, Time Magazine came out with a lead article that said, is God dead? And the next day, a reporter asked Billy Graham, uh, is God dead, Dr. Graham? <laughs> Dr. Graham said, are you kidding me? I just talked to him. Now, listen, prayer is how we talk to God. The Bible is how he talks to us. Now, if you're familiar with the scripture, you know that the Bible is filled with references to communication between God and his people. God spoke to Moses through a burning bush. Nehemiah said in the book of Nehemiah, God spoke to his heart and led him to rebuild Jerusalem and restore the nation of Israel to prominence in the fifth century BC. At Christmas time, we always talk about how God spoke to Joseph and Mary through angels right before Jesus was born. When Jesus was baptized, I mean, a crowd of witnesses heard the voice of God say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Well, friends, according to the blueprint of the New Testament church, the primary way God speaks to us today is through the apostles' teaching, through the Bible. Now, unfortunately, not everybody appreciates or values God's word the way we do, right? I love the story about the little old lady. She just loved the Lord, you know, and she got into a conversation with a skeptic who didn't believe in God, didn't believe in the Bible. And the guy said, man, do you, you mean to tell me you really believe in the Bible? She said, I absolutely do. He said, do you believe all the stories in the Bible are true? She said, I believe the Bible from Genesis to maps. 
<laughs> now, if you don't have a Bible, there are maps in the back. All right, you know what I'm talking about. All right. So the guy said, do you believe in the story of Jonah and the whale? And she said, well, it doesn't actually say it was a whale, but yes, I believe that story. He said, how did he survive in that whale? She said, I don't know. He said, well, I thought you said you believe the story. She said, I do believe the story. I just don't know how he survived in there. When I get to heaven, I'll ask him. And the skeptic said, well, what if he's not in heaven? <laughs> she said, you ask him. <laughs> now, all right, now, stop, 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 stop. Now, here's the reality. Most Americans own a Bible. In fact, American demographics reported that 60% of the atheists and the agnostics in America own a Bible. But friends, just because you got one doesn't mean you have read it or believe it. And if you don't, you won't benefit from it. Now, friends, the Bible is the primary way that God speaks to his people today. Listen, listen to what the Apostle Paul, I mean, talk about a guy who is transformed from a murderer to a minister. Paul said, all scripture is God breathed. Think about that. It's Genesis is in God. This is not cleverly devised things by smart people. All scripture is God breathed. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training and righteousness. Why? So that the man or woman of God can be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Friends, listen, the Bible is not just a great man-made collection of wisdom and neat thoughts. Paul says the scripture, I mean the Old Testament and the New Testament are God breathed. That means it has its genesis in God. Consequently, it is absolutely reliable. And dude, let me tell you, if you read it and you sing it and you hear it taught, you can count on God communicating with you through the Bible. Sometimes it will guide you. Sometimes he will correct you. Sometimes he will comfort you. Sometimes he will train you. And can I just tell you for what it's worth, and I know it might not be worth to you, but for me, I am totally and completely convinced of the criticality of the apostles teaching to your spiritual life. Consequently, I have submitted my whole life to the authority of the New Testament. Friends, I've spent the last 50 years of my life trying to follow the New Testament. And I want you to know I have no regrets about building my life on the teachings of this book. Now, I have nightmares and flashbacks about times I have disregarded the wisdom of the Bible and paid the price for that. But friends, I have no regrets about building my life on the teachings of Scripture. Now, I don't know, I was looking at the Internet this week and I saw this, you know, young, 20-something-year-old entertainer who had an article saying, I wish I'd had more premarital sex back when I was a teenager. And I read that article and I thought, what an idiot. Because, you know, she's a wealthy entertainer looking back on a life of sexual purity, thinking, man, I wish I'd had more sex when I was younger. Let me tell you, if she was a single mom living in public housing with four kids from four different men who are all absent because of her premarital sex, she wouldn't feel that way. She should be thankful that she apparently accidentally followed the teaching of God's word about sexual purity. Let me tell you what this book has done for me. It led me to a saving relationship with the God who created this universe. This book led me to a life-changing relationship with Jesus and the forgiveness of my sins and the power to break the destructive hold of sin on my life. This book freed me from the shame that just stalked me over past mistakes. And this book taught me that God doesn't hold anything against me anymore that he has forgiven. This book is showing me how to build a strong marriage and raise my kids and bless my grandkids and build lasting friendships and handle my money and my body and harness my appetites and reconcile relationships that have been bruised. Dude, this book has comforted me in sorrow, strengthened me in weakness, rebuked me when I rebelled, affirmed me when I've been faithful and obey. Friends, the Bible has given me a perspective on my past and wisdom for the present and hope for the future. Dude, it describes where I will spend eternity. And we're going to spend some time talking about that in a few weeks from now. I can't wait to talk with you about heaven. It's so much better than anything you'll ever have here. I don't know what I would do without the Bible. Dude, I love it. I submit to it. I respect it. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, I intend to read it and follow it carefully for the rest of my life. Now, friends, look at what Paul said again. And here's the goal of the scripture. Transformation, life change. Dude, that's what the Bible does best. Paul says that, you know, it teaches us, it rebukes us, it corrects us, it trains us in righteousness so that the people of God will be thoroughly equipped for every good work. 
It's amazing. <laughs> you know, several years ago, we helped a young man, uh, a young pastor named Vince Antonucci start a church on the Strip in Las Vegas. And we've sent mission, trip, mission teams there almost every year since then. And they've helped, you know, Vince uh, launch that church. And we've gotten some great ideas from them. That's where we got the idea for our Sunshine Girls ministry, which is a minister, ministry to uh, women who are trapped in the adult entertainment industry. And man, we've baptized a lot of those ladies into Christ and set them free in Christ. It's been awesome. But Vince grew up in a family with no church background, zero. I mean, his mother was Jewish. His daddy was a professional gambler. When he, became, when he went to college, he had never been to church. And as far as he knows, he had never met a Christian. And he said he was in college one day and he was watching TV, online service. And he said this really strange guy came on the religious channel. And here's what he said. Now, you've probably heard that Jesus was crucified on Friday and rose from the dead on Sunday. But I'm going to prove to you today that Jesus really was buried on Thursday. <laughs> and Vince said his reaction to that that was his first reaction to the apostles' teaching. And he thought to himself, that is the dumbest thing I have ever heard. I mean, as if you could prove or disprove what day something happened on 2,000 years ago, right? But he just couldn't get it out of his head. I mean, that this guy was so passionate in his belief that there was evidence to substantiate what day of the week Jesus was killed on. And I mean, Vince was a pre-law major, so this kind of fascinated him. A couple days later, he goes over to his girlfriend's dorm room. He sees a Bible on her bookshelf that somebody must have given her. It was still wrapped in plastic, so she's doing something else. He grabs it and steals it. And it was, <laughs> it was a student Bible. And so, you know, it had an organized reading plan in there for the life of Moses, life of David, life of Jesus. And so, you know, Vince thinks, hey, I'm going to read this life of Jesus thing and see if I can get to the bottom of this raging controversy about what day of the week Jesus died on that apparently is tearing up Christianity. And the more Vince read, the more the word of God affected him, the more the Holy Spirit convicted him the more real Jesus seemed to him. And eventually, before he ever met a Christ follower or yielded, he yielded his life to Jesus because of what he read about Jesus in the Bible. He'd never been to church and never met a Christian that he knew of. Now, you know what Vince is doing today? He's not a lawyer. He's a pastor who is teaching the word of God at Verve Church in Las Vegas. And that church is reaching people who were just like him and leading them to a life changing relationship with Jesus. Friends, the Bible is not just a book where you read about God. It's a book where you encounter God. And friends, how is that going to happen if you never read it and you never study it? And listen, most of us, for most of us, the best place to encounter the scripture is not when we're alone, but man, when God speaks to us through gifted teachers at church. Now, friends, do you ever remember being at church and just getting hit by God's word? I mean, you went through the worship and the teaching and you just felt like God was speaking directly to you. Well, let me tell you something. He was. I mean, at that very moment, God was speaking through a worship leader or a teacher at a gathering of believers that he designed to deliver a message from him to you. Listen to what Paul said about how we respond. Man, when we receive the teaching of the word at church, Paul said to his friends in Thessalonica, we also thank God continually because when you, talking about the church in Thessalonica, received the word of God, which you heard from us, dude, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it actually is the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. Friends, God speaks through preachers and teachers and worship leaders and D group leaders. And if you listen consistently, you'll get hit. You will get hit. You remember the summer of 1974? <laughs> you remember 1974? Richard Nixon just resigned the presidency of the United States. Uh, Muhammad Ali and George Foreman uh, fought the rumble in the jungle in Zaire. Uh, 55 mile an hour speed limit was first imposed, first time in American history to save gas. Stephen King published his first novel and Cam Huxford was on his way to Point University to prepare for the ministry. And the week before I started college to prepare for the ministry, I went to the Southern Christian Youth Convention in Atlanta. And I heard a preacher named Wayne Smith, who became one of my favorite preachers, but I heard him for the first time. 
Now y'all, I grew up in South Carolina in a little tiny micro church. I mean, if we had 80 people at church, we just thought, holy mackerel, look at all these people. And when I got to the Southern Christian Youth Convention, there were 2,000 teenagers, 2,000 students from all across the South. I couldn't believe it. I was 17 years old. I'd never seen that many Christ followers in one place in my life. And man, they started the services and it was so encouraging. I mean, I thought I was the only Christian in my school almost. And look at all these students that love the Lord. We're not alone. And the music was awesome and it was powerful and it spoke to my generation. So it was super moving. And then Wayne's message was so biblical and so engaging. And dude, he had this great sense of humor. So I mean, it was not a minute in that message, the whole service. I'd never even been in a service like that before. And then Wayne started telling the story about a pastor friend of his who had died that summer, 53 years old, suddenly died. And that story caught my attention. Wayne talked about the noble life that man lived because he had embraced the values of the Bible. He talked about the courage and loyalty that he had demonstrated to God and his family and his church. He talked about the energy that man had invested in a super fruitful ministry that tragically now had been cut short by that guy's untimely death. And then Wayne asked a question that rocked my soul. Who's going to take his place? Who's going to take his place? A warrior has fallen. Somebody needs to step up and fill that spot in the battle line. Who's going to live that kind of life? Who's going to give that kind of effort? Who's going to demonstrate that kind of character? Dude, there's a hole in the battle line that needs to be filled. Somebody needs to step up. Who's going to step up and fill it? <laughs> and I'm telling you, man, those words hit me like a sledgehammer. I'm telling you, my world got very small. And for just a moment there, it was just me and God. And I basically believed that God was communicating to me. I feel like he was saying, Cam, this is what I expect from people who are in the ministry. The church is not a cruise ship, bro. It's a battleship. We are at war. Lives are at stake. What we do is important. It demands your best. And if that's not what you're going to give, then do something else. But if it is, saddle up right now. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, when that service was over, I had heard from God. And it was a defining moment that has marked my life to this day. Friends, that was 46 years years ago, I could tell you where I was sitting. I can still feel the impact of that service. What if I'd missed that? <laughs> what, what if I'd missed that message that turned out to be the defining moment of my life? I mean, what if I'd stayed home in my pajamas and not felt the power of that gathering? You know, if, if I'd not been around all those like-minded believers, if I'd not been moved by that music or impacted by that message, what if I was riding a stupid motorcycle? or hunting, or golfing, or, or at the beach. Friends, this is why I hate for any of us to ever miss a single week of worship, because you never know when the Lord is going to communicate some big, life-changing insight from His Word to you. And it doesn't happen every week. It doesn't happen every week for anybody. And that's why you can't afford to miss the week when it could happen for you. Listen, listen to what Paul says it's happening when the church gathers together to hear the apostles teaching. He says, this is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit. We express spiritual truths and spiritual words. And dude, it makes a spiritual difference. Man, when your heart is opened by the church worshiping together, and then you hear some gifted teacher unpack the word of God with power, and God gets a message through to you, your life changes. And I'm telling you, the more worship and teaching you experience, the more God can talk to you. <laughs> and that's why once a week is not enough. I mean, of course, yeah, we need to read God's word every day. And if you're not doing that, man, join me in our New Testament challenge. Read a chapter a day. We're going to read through the entire New Testament in one year. It's like data loading your mind with this life changing truth. And listen, reading the scripture provides invaluable information. 
that the Holy Spirit can then use to lead you and guide you in the right direction and warn you and convict you when you start to scrape up on the guardrails, right? And of course, you need to join a discipleship group where you can study the Bible with your friends. And listen, in just the next few verses of Acts chapter two, it talks about how the church organized these discipleship groups and they met at homes and it transformed their city. I mean, we're going to talk about that next week. But, you know, Bible study provides invaluable explanation. I mean, this is where you can ask a question. And listen, there are no stupid questions, but there aren't a lot of comfortable places to ask the questions you have. And that's what these groups provide. Man, they meet together to talk about what God's word means and how you will live if you believe it. But friends, listen, you also need to make gathering for weekly worship a priority. Because, man, the Bible speaks so clearly and so powerfully about how when the body is together and dude, all 12 cylinders are hitting at the same time. I'm telling you, man, when the body meets together to worship and learn the word, it provides this inspiration that just moves us to a new place spiritually. And I'm telling you, man, that spiritual inspiration comes with power and consistency that not many people experience when they're sitting by themselves reading the Bible alone or looking at a video screen. You know, James Davis is our pastor out at our Statesboro campus, and he was telling me that our Statesboro campus, uh, they got a, a friend of his that just recently locked on uh, to Christ during these online services, and, and man, it's taken him to a new place spiritually, and, and it's, it's so cool. But last week, they had Sunday morning watch party at our Statesboro campus, and it was awesome. And a bunch of people came for worship, and man, they just loved it. And James said, my guy was there. And he told me how moving it was to see that guy worshiping with the body and locked onto the message and taking notes like crazy. You know what he's doing? He's growing stronger. Because man, I'm telling you, when we gather together to worship, it's information plus explanation plus inspiration. And it creates that spiritual synergy that just changes things. And you don't want to miss that. You do not want to miss that. A few years ago, one of our missionaries told me about an African man in Zimbabwe who found Christ by reading the Bible in a very unusual way. And his name was Gambarambi. Now, Gambarambi was just one of these guys, never met a stranger, loved to talk to everybody, kind of a, you know, character. And so he'd sit by the side of the road and uh, pe talk to people and he'd smoke these hand-rolled cigarettes. You know, he was a smoker. And so he'd roll them in newsprint, which is, I, I understand is not the best. But anyway, he would roll these uh, cigarettes, smoke them, talk. That's what he did. One of our Bible translators was translating the New Testament into his language. And he wanted to give Gambrambi a New Testament. But Gambrambi said, I don't think that would be a good idea. And he said, why not? He said, well, if you give it to me, then I'm just going to tear the pages out and use it to roll up cigarettes. And my friend thought, uh, you're right, I better not give you a New Testament because if you do that, the Lord might strike you. With, not, but never mind. But anyway, the, the translator was conflicted about this. I mean, he knew Gambrami needed to read the script. He needed to know the story about Jesus. But he wasn't really fond of the idea of him tearing the pages out for cigarettes. And so he prayed and prayed about it. And this is what he finally decided. He told Gambrami, I'll give you a New Testament and you have permission to tear the pages out to use to roll cigarettes if you promise to read the pages first. And Gam Romney said, well, that sounds like a good deal to me. That's a good source of a cigarette paper. And so he takes the New Testament. Now, fast forward 15 years, there's a national gathering of the United Bible Society. They're meeting in Zimbabwe. There's a pastor on stage. He's sharing his testimony. And his name is Gambarambi. And he tells a story. He said, I smoke Matthew. I smoke Mark. I smoke Luke. And I smoke John till I got to John 3.16 and I smoked no more. You know what he read there, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And so today, friends, instead of smoking the gospel, Gam Bromby is preaching the gospel. And this gospel that changed his life is changing other people's lives. Now listen, the gospel never changes more lives more powerfully than it does when the church gathers to worship and learn and serve together. And friends, I believe somebody listening to this message has gotten hit today. I believe the word has hit somebody today. God has been speaking to you. You know it. 
Maybe it's the first time it's ever happened in your life. And friends, if that's you, listen to the words of Hebrews 3.15. Today, if you hear God's voice speaking to you, do not harden your heart against him. Man, go to the chat right now. Don't wait until September 23rd. Dude, hit that prayer button at the bottom of your screen right now and say, I need to talk to somebody about Jesus. I want somebody to explain to me how I can have a relationship with Jesus. Listen, I was sitting in a worship service, small little church I grew up in, in South Carolina, with my family and friends. I was sitting there listening to the gospel when the scales fell from my eyes. And for the first time, I knew I needed to be forgiven. I needed the Lord. Thank God it was information and explanation that I heard while I was gathered with a group of believers that inspired me to get moving and become a part of God's family. And it happened for me. And it can happen for you if you get moving. Let me pray for you. And I pray that you will. Father, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity that we have today to hear your word. And Lord, we're hearing it online because of a global pandemic. But I pray God that very soon, many of us who are listening to this today will be hearing this on one of our campuses. We'll be engaging with your word, Lord, in a way that will be life changing. But I believe that there are people who have heard this today and it's gonna be life changing for them right now. Lord, I'm amazed at how, you know, the word is so powerful and moving in big groups. But sometimes, Lord, when it's just us, you hear it's just as hard. And I pray, God, that you bless that person who's listening today who needs to take that next step. Father, we love you. We thank you for your love for us. I pray, God, that somebody today will receive Christ because they have heard your word today. And we pray this in Jesus' strong name, Lord. Amen. 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 Okay, now listen, before you get away, don't, don't, don't take off. Don't turn me off right now. Let me give you a couple discussion questions and just keep this thing going so you can personalize it a little bit and you can learn from each other. Turn to somebody who's with you right now and ask them question, this question. Have you ever had an aha moment with the Lord because of his word? I mean, were you, you were at a church service or you were reading on your devotions or you were in a Bible study and it's like, boom, you suddenly saw something you've never seen before. If you've ever had a moment like that, just turn to the person next to you and say, I was at church camp. I was at Savannah Christian back in the day. I was at Compassion Christian. Now, wherever it was, just share that moment. And here's another question for you to think about. Can you think of a time that God communicated something to you through a gifted teacher? Now, I got saved because of a guy named Wendell Baggett. He was not my preacher. He never served at our church. But I, he spoke at our church one time and I heard the gospel and my life changed. Can you think of a time when you heard the word through a, a gifted teacher and then share what happened in your life because you did? Now, friends, we love you. Thanks for coming to be a part of this. Remember, September 23 and 27, we're regathering the whole church. The two weeks prior to that, on Wednesday and on Sunday, we're having volunteer training services. Please pray and fast with me for God's power to just bless us as we regather our church. Looking forward to seeing you soon. God bless you. God bless.